Now on BBC Radio 4, a dark and powerful fairy tale retold by Sarah Maitland. The reader is Leah Williams, and this is Mother Love. In the moment of my triumph, they came. Their wing beats strumming on the air, a bright wedge of glory and power. Seven swans like an arrowhead, winging out of the sunrise. They struck terror into my heart. Even in my terror, I kept an eye on her. She was standing on the pyre, ready, I suppose, for what was coming, and the executioner was approaching with burning firebrands. She looked calm, almost complacent, as haughty and as cold as always. Then as the throbbing sound filled the silent air, she looked up and smiled. I saw her smile, those green eyes widening with delight. I did not look at my son. But without looking, I knew he would be biting his lower lip so as not to weep. I could almost be angry at his weakness. But it is horrible for a mother to know she has hurt her son, even when it is for his own good. Men can be very foolish, and it is a mother's task to protect them from the consequences of their own folly. What would any mother have done? if her son went off hunting while she worked away tirelessly and came home with a half-naked trollop wrapped in his own royal cloak and announced he's going to marry her. She was not even that pretty. Little and scrawny, with that strange white skin and huge green cat's eyes. Handsome is as handsome does. And what she did was silence. She never spoke, she never laughed, she never sang. There was something in her total silence which I knew was not right. You could see she was not dumb or stupid. She just refused to talk. And then there was her endless sewing. She was making men's shirts out of a strange, coarse fabric. Each shirt took a whole year of exquisite, precise sewing to make, and then she would fold it with the others in a chest in her own chamber. She would not tell me what they were for. Her silence insulted and assaulted me. It was unbreakable. Somehow it kept her safe, hidden from me in a cloud of dark and painful purity. It was a gauntlet thrown in my face. So I'm not ashamed of what I did. I only acted for his good. He refused to see that she was dangerous. So when she gave birth to their first son, I went in the night and took the baby. I smeared her mouth with goat's blood. I told her what I was doing. I told her she had only to call out and the midwife would come running. But if she did not speak, I would tell them, tell him, that she was a monster who had eaten her own child and she would burn for a witch. For a moment I thought I had won. She opened her eyes wide in shocked horror and reached out for the child, but I laughed. She set her face and looked away. She did not speak or call out or beg or cry. She was silent and made no answer. He... Poor fool would not believe it. 
It took three babies before his confidence wavered. I, naturally, I did not harm my own grandchildren. I took them to my quarters in the palace. I raised them better than she would ever have done. They would not even have learned to babble if she had had the care of them. It was for their own good that I did it. Theirs and his. I could see his doubts begin to grow, his confidence begin to shake, his love begin to wane. Wait. We will all just wait, he said. I was sympathetic. In the tidal wave of misery and horror that she had inflicted on us all, he turned to me again for comfort and support. Her third labour was long and hard. She never uttered a word. Towards evening she gave birth to another son, a healthy, lusty little boy. We put him into her arms, washed and swaddled, and she held him wearily but with tenderness, lifting his head to smooth it with her cheek. She was weeping, great silent tears running down her pale face. Don't you want to tell me about it? I asked her very gently. I think at that moment I really wanted her to speak, to tell, to redeem herself. But she would not. This time you will burn, I told her. She looked straight at me. A frightened, tragic look. But she would not speak. I did not know. I was uncertain suddenly whether I had won or lost. It did not matter now. It was too late. In the morning, my son came up to her chamber formally accompanied by the Chancellor, the Chief Justice, and three of his closest friends. So he knew what he would find. He stood in the door with his retinue and looked at her bloodied face and at the empty cradle. Now what? he said to the Chief Justice. She must burn said the old man formally and produced a document prepared in advance. My son signed it. I was proud of him. He had arrived ready and in control. Do you have anything to say in your own defence? he asked her. But she was silent. At dawn tomorrow then, he turned and left the room, as white as she was. And immediately she got out of bed, went over to the window, sat down, and started to do her sewing. When they brought her out the next morning, I could see she was carrying the shirts over her arm. She held her head high and walked tall, despite that long labour. I could almost admire her obduracy and dignity. She climbed up the bonfire and then turned to face us. The executioner advanced with a flaming torch. The whole court was as silent as she was. And then, in the moment of my triumph, they came. Seven swans like an arrowhead, winging out of the sunrise, their wing beats thrumming on the air, a wedge of glory and power. She smiled. 
and as the swans came, straight, fast towards her, she gathered the shirts into her hand and tossed them all high into the air, and each swan caught one in its flame orange bill. As they caught the shirt, she cried out, My brothers! Her voice was like a bell across the silent courtyard. Suddenly, there were no swans. There were seven young men surrounding her, embracing her, laughing, drawing their swords. She slipped between them, running towards her husband and he towards her. She was in his arms, almost gabbling after her long silence. These are my brothers. They were enchanted into swans. I had to rescue them. I took an oath. I had to keep silent for seven years and make seven shirts for them out of Starward. I had to stay silent and keep my promise. It is done. They are restored. It is seven years today, and it is over. He held her so close, so tenderly. He was silent now. But the Lord Chancellor said, What about the little princes? You ate your babies. No! Oh, no! She cried out. There was a pause. And I realised that she would not accuse me. The little fool! And then... The stupid girl I had employed to nurse the boys came down from my wing of the palace and out of my own privy door, carrying the new baby and leading the other two. She done it, said the ungrateful wench, jabbing an arm at me. She stole em, each and every time. My own son raised his head and looked straight into my face for a long moment. Then he turned to the waiting court and said coldly, Don't dismantle the pyre. We will need it tomorrow. And she had the nerve to plead for me. I do not want her mercy or her pity because I was right all along. I'm not fooled. She is dangerous. What true woman prefers her brothers to her children? Her so-called integrity to her own son's lives? I am not ashamed of what I did. <laughs>